before we get to today's show, just a quick reminder that you can get the most comprehensive digest of China Africa news delivered daily to your email inbox. Try it out for three months for just three dollars at chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Witt University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa-China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Syndica Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to take a little break from the politics, debt, economics that we've been talking about for the past few months. And we're going to return to a subject that we haven't talked about, oh, gosh, since back in April. Uh, by the way, on the issue of politics, we've got a couple great shows coming up this week and later next week talking about the new Biden administration and the approach to China-Africa relations. So we got some great guests lined up for you there. So for those of you who are really hungry for more politics, just bear with us. But today we're going to have a little bit of a break from that. Kobus, as we mentioned back in April, there was the Guangzhou incident that erupted when it was really what we called back then a rupture in the China-Africa relation. It was a very hurtful period for a lot of people who felt that the, the discrimination that occurred against black residents in Guangzhou, the southern Chinese city, uh, really had a profound impact. And since then, it has really shaped the discourse of a lot of the civil society relations, the people-to-people -people ties. And even to this day, Kobus, you and I participate in webinars and discussions, and the issue of what happened in Guangzhou keeps coming up again and again. And it really shows what a lasting impact that had. Yes, it's it's really, you know, I, I don't think we, we're going to get over the impact soon. Um, it's also, I think, really important to, to kind of circle back to the issue of the experiences of individual black people, both African and non-African, in China, um, because it really lies at the heart of all of, of China-Africa studies. That, that's, you know, kind of when, when it developed as a field, that was the issue that people were really focusing on. Um, and it's, it's great to revisit it today. And when we talk about the black experience in Hong Kong and in China and greater China, so often it comes down to really two categories of people come to mind. Either you have the trader who's based in Iwu or in Guangzhou, oftentimes coming from Nigeria, and that's, again, the image of what we saw in Guangzhou, or we have now the image of an African student, and there really isn't much other space that's in between. And so that really is unfortunate, and there's a very, very exciting new podcast that is new to the market that's out there that aims to fill that void in the missing narrative about the black experience, uh, in this case in Hong Kong, but it really talks to a larger black experience in China as well. Rather than me just formally introduce the hosts of the podcast, which we'll get to, I'm going to have them introduce themselves as they've done on their show. Hi, welcome to Homegrown, the podcast where we aim to inform, inspire, and entertain through personal stories of Black experts. I was clearly made for radio. It sounds so fake. That's what I sound like. That's not what you sound like. That's what I sound like. That's you how sound, I speak. You sound like a mean old stepmother. That's what you sound like. Oh, word. <laughs> okay. Welcome to Homegrown, the podcast where we aim to inform, inspire, and entertain through personal stories of black expats. We're your hosts, Fantastic Foe and the Lousy Lou. What? <laughs> what? The Fantastic Foe and Louisa. <laughs> what did you say my name like that? The Fantastic Foe. And, and the amazing Lou. What? That's so unfair. Choose. I don't know. No. Choose your choice. No, Lou's, no, no, no. Lou the loser. No. The lousy Lou. No, 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 no. Lucifer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm offended at how loudly you're laughing. I feel like that's not the first time you've had that thought. Welcome to Homegrown, the podcast where we aim to inform, inspire, and entertain through personal stories of black expats. And here they are, for real, fantastic foe and Louisa, the lovely Louisa, I might add, by the way. I disagree with your co-host. Uh, welcome to the show from Hong Kong. We really appreciate it. A very good evening to both of you. Thank you. Good evening. Good Thanks evening. for having us. 
and and that little snippet there that you guys heard it, where they're just cracking each other up is really that's the podcast is the chemistry of the show is absolutely hysterical and at the same time the show while it they have a lot of fun they're also tackling a lot of sensitive issues. We're going to dive into a lot of those more controversial issues related to what black expat life is like in Hong Kong. Uh, but first, before we get started, uh, you know, fantastic folk, can you first tell us a little bit about yourself and then Louisa do the same just so we can get an understanding of your Hong Kong story and your backstory and how you kind of came to the podcast? Start with you first, fantastic folk. Thanks. Um, so I work for a, a manufacturing company in the UK and I transferred over to Hong Kong in 2019, April, um, to take on yeah, uh, a new role. And I'd spent about six months, um, a year before in Taiwan doing work for that company. So I'd gotten used to sort of what um, Asia was like and I fell in love with it. So when they offered the job to Hong Kong, I was like, yep, sure, 100%. Um, and then I moved over and obviously because it was a British company, a lot of the expats in the office were um, British as well. So me being the only black person in the office meant that a lot of the guidance and information that they gave me was kind of not really suited to me in terms of where to get a haircut and where to buy certain types of food and that sort of thing. And after a couple of months of being in Hong Kong and meeting people and like eventually getting sort of situated I realized that, oh, you know, it would have been amazing if there was, you know, a central repository of all this kind of stuff that, you know, once I landed, I could have um, sort of jumped onto and got on a vibe for where to go, um, where the bars and restaurants that I would be interested in are and that sort of thing. So um, the podcast kind of is a result of that experience, kind of a group of us sitting around and going, you know, we all had the same thing of not knowing what to expect when we arrived and it would have been amazing to have some Instagram group or podcast or something that would be like, um, here's what it's like finding a school. Here's what it's like, you know, um, getting your Hong Kong ID. Here's what it's like getting a taxi, these kind of things, because it is different slightly for black people. Um, I think that when you're from other ethnic backgrounds, you have more of a community that will help you out. But in Hong Kong, especially, there's quite there's such few pe black people that it's um, a lot harder to get that information and get you feeling at home as quickly as possible, which is what keeps you here and makes you want to stay and love it. So I'm Louisa or Lou or Lousy Lou, apparently, <laughs> but I'm going to go with Lovely Lou. Um, so I'm a legal project manager at a UK based law firm. I actually came to Hong Kong for the first time in July 2018. So it was a three month secondment at the time as part of a talent program that I was on. And it was my first time in Asia. So it was, I mean, I'd traveled a lot before that, but never to Asia. So getting here, I fell in love more or less straight away. I finished my secondment and went back to London and was just, I wasn't having it. So I, I begged and pleaded and did everything I could um, and eventually moved back out here on a more permanent basis in February 2019. And I've been here since, so it's supposed to be for a year. Here we are, a little bit longer than that later. And um, I was really struck when I first came out on secondment by how friendly everyone was. And I think, like Fo said, it's a it's quite a small um, black community out here. So while I was, it was great to come out here and and meet new people and meet people from all over the world. There was definitely that sense of affinity meeting the odd black person. Um, and really coming back out in February last year, it, I guess I was more comfortable with the idea of just making friends. So if I ever saw black people around, it's like, oh my gosh, you're here. What are you doing here? And you sort of have an automatic connection in a way. And then, you know, the more you discuss, the more your friendships deepen, you find that there are similarities in, in people's experiences, but also there's such a range of narratives. And, you know, very similar to what you were saying before about um, the typical profile of who you'd think of as a black person in, in China, especially, um, there is that almost PR issue and there is very much a single narrative. And in addition to sharing information about the city and all of that, there's a real um, drive for us to showcase just the range of people you have out here, the excellence that exists um, in this city, you know, in Asia in general. And that's really uh, one of the, the key things that you, you get as a result of the podcast. 
Yeah, that, that range of experience was really impressive for me. It's, it's very interesting to hear all these different perspectives. Um, you know, l l as you say, you know, because all of these different different people coming to Hong Kong, what, what would you say are some of some of the shared experiences be between them, Lou? <laughs> so one that's a, a very light one, but actually very, it happened to me just yesterday, is um, around the service received. And I think the most common one is when it comes to taxis. So um, in terms of an experience from a race perspective in, in Hong Kong, I have found that most people don't seem to have many outright um, racial issues. So like someone maybe shouting racial slurs or anything like that. It tends to be that there are a lot of microaggressions or people are treated differently. And a very the most common one that I've come across is when it comes to Hong Kong taxis. So either, you know, people refusing to serve you or them being rude or that, you know, whatever that looks like. So it happened to me just yesterday, in fact. And even after a couple of years of being here and knowing that it's very common and I shouldn't take it personally, just yesterday, it really upset me. And that happens to people constantly and, and in different forms. Um, and I would say that that's something I would say almost every one of our guests has experienced. And mm -hmm. while it might sound trivial, it really, you know, it builds up. And people respond to that in different ways. Well, let's hear from one of your guests, Minu Bakana, who's a Congolese Frenchman living in Hong Kong. You guys did a show and the question of taxis came up. I think this moment happened to a lot of people. But this one particular occurrence for me was very uh, interesting because uh, I had the opportunity to actually respond and actually confront uh, the person who did that thing to me. What did that person do, you may ask, right? So it's like a few months ago, uh, I was having fun with my friends, with my girlfriend and her friends in bars, and we wanted to go home. So we went on the streets and like everybody else, we were hailing for a taxi, right? So I said, okay, let me go hail a taxi from over there and you hail the taxi from over there. Like, let's not be together when we hail for a taxi. So I'm hailing, she's hailing. And there is this cab who obviously slows down in front of me and then reaccelerates to slow down in front of my girlfriend. So basically this taxi sees me, decides to not take me and just stop 50 meters later in front of my girlfriend. The thing that this taxi driver didn't know is that this girl was my girlfriend. So he opens the door for her. He's like, yeah, come inside. And me, I got into the taxi. <laughs> And when I got into the taxi, the taxi driver, he looked at me with so much, like, he had really big eyes, like, whoa, what are you, what are you doing here? And then he started to speak in Chinese. So I didn't understand what he was saying. But my girlfriend, she's from here, she's local. Even if she doesn't look like it, she's half Indian, but she's local. So she speaks Chinese. So she understood him and she decided to confront him right away. Like, hey, what are you doing? Why didn't you stop for my boyfriend? And the guy was trying to, to, you know, to give some excuses like, you know, I didn't know he was aiming for a taxi, blah, blah, blah. And my girlfriend said, no, obviously he was. He had his hand up and you didn't stop. You just accelerated. So that's racist. And the guy, after a few, I would say, not insults, but a few big words <laughs> with my girlfriend, he was like, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. By the end, he was like, I'm sorry. Even me, I was like, okay, you know what? Don't worry, it's fine. I, I, I was even talking to my girlfriend, don't worry, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then you just brought us home. So that story for me is very telling because it happens all the time. And it's sometimes based just on color. This thing happened to me maybe 15 times, but that time I was able to enter the taxi afterwards. I just, Fo, I thought that was such an interesting story, the way that both Louisa and also Aminu you know, talked about that experience, and that's something that other people won't necessarily understand. But that being said, the complaints about taxi service is a common complaint in the United States and in other parts of Europe as well. It's not unique to Hong Kong. At least, definitely in England, it's a lot more obvious. I think in Hong Kong, like Louisa said, it's it's micro, so you can... It's one of those that it's a kind of gaslighty, so you don't know whether you're being too sensitive. Or does, does, does this happen to everyone? Is it, you know, you're not sure whether it's whether it's a race thing, whereas in England, you know, it's especially depending on where you go in England, you know, it's a racial thing. Sometimes people shout things at you in the car as they drive past or throw things at you. 
and you know they have you know racial slurs that are in English that you can hear and understand. <laughs> um, so uh, it's a lot more it's a lot more obvious in England when it happens. Um, in 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 Hong Kong, it's it's because like Louisa said, you got here and everyone is really nice. Um, you then start to question whether yeah it's it's kind of a difficult one to to judge you you kind of question yourself a little bit more luisa in in speaking with all of all of your different guests do you find that african americans or um you know or like europeans from from of african descent have different experiences than africans um in in hong kong oh that's a that's a great question i would say that well for starters everyone's experience is so different so even so say we were looking at just africans everyone's experience is different based on where they grew up based on so for example if um one of our episodes with cats he's had quite a different experience so he um spent his his younger years in Ghana and he had quite a different experience for me for example and my experience in um growing up in Nigeria and London um i would say that there's a definite difference here um and it's very much around i guess class or socioeconomic status depending on you know how you look at it so there is very much a sense of if you're an expat you're a little bit more all right so you're so i would say that so for me where i live in hong kong for example is very much an expat focused community so while i might have the odd microaggression it's a very different experience to maybe a nigerian man that lives in tst or lives somewhere that's a little bit more local so the experiences are definitely very different and of of course based on your job i work at a law firm so in terms of the the areas that i am i i would be seen differently um so while i might still experience racial issues it would be very different to someone else who was perceived as different and in fact i would say that a, a, an easy one for me to spot is depending on how i'm dressed i'm treated differently so on days where i decide to dress more casually maybe i'm in sportswear I am treated very very differently from if I'm dressed up maybe going to work on my way to work. So um a way that this manifests is actually when it comes to the police and I think especially for um the black men out here. So one of our close friends so for nice uh really close friends here. He um has a, I mean he's an expert here. He has a great job um at a technology firm, but he's very I guess his his style of dress is very hipster if you want to call it that. So he dresses very casually. This man has been stopped by the police 19 times I think it is, is that right? Yeah, yeah, 19. 19 times in the space of 4 years. And what are they stopping him for? Immigration check? What are they what's the That sort of thing. It's just um it's just it's a random check. Can we random see your, in quotes that is. <laughs> can we see your uh Hong Kong ID and I guess typically if you can't produce it then they go down a rabbit hole with mm. you but he typically always has that so it ends there. Yeah. But I think in the latter sort of instances he's <laughs> more legal with it and going okay this this is the 17th time so it's not random yes. so can you why have know? you stopped me and then it becomes a discussion you and know. then it, and then it goes away but it, it it's it still persists mm. I mean. and just to give you a little bit of contrast i lived in hong kong for 5 years i went to hong kong university and not once have i ever been stopped for, by the police for anything not once. <laughs> Five years of living there. And I've been going back and forth to Hong Kong for 30 years and never, I mean, so clearly people are, are being treated differently. But I guess the key question is, and again, your show, and I, I really want to be very fair here because we're talking about a lot of the negatives and your show is really about a lot of the positives. So I don't want to leave people with the impression that this is, that your show is a gripe fest and everybody's just complaining how awful it is. And it's not it at all. But you are bringing out a lot of these complex issues. So let's put them out on the table. Since Guangzhou, and that was really a marker in a lot of people's kind of awareness of what the black experience is like in China. And it's not a universal or necessarily a representative experience. But nonetheless, that's what made it into CNN and onto the BBC. And that's what people see you will see that Chinese society, whether it's in Hong Kong or mainland China, is racist towards black people. How do you respond to that type of statement? I think it's probably best answered by one of our guests, Tracy, who said, you know, in Hong Kong or China, you'll be treated based on the door to which you come into the country. So if you come in through the expat door, you'll be treated like an expat. And if you come through the refugee or asylum seeker route, you'll be treated in a separate, different way. I think that the statement 
China or Hong Kong is racist towards black people, definitely in my experience is probably a bit too blanket. I think that it's it's a lot more complex than that. I think that, you know, um, situation and education and age and... I guess exposure. And exposure mm. and, and class come into that a lot more. I think it's a lot more you know, um, de- de- situation dependent. That's why, you know, our friend has been stopped 19 times by the police in four years and I've never been stopped by the police at all. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that it's too, it, yeah, it's too, from from my experience, it's it would be too much of a blanket statement. You know, over over the last while in, in China-Africa relations, there's been a lot of discussion about, about, the specific words to use for people who move to other countries, particularly the, you know, kind of expat versus migrant versus immigrant. Um, which words do you prefer and wh- what is what is some of your thinking behind it? That's, a, that's something we've been talking about a lot. In fact, we took it to our social media just over the last week, um, talking about it with our community. So we have actively claimed the term expat. So we specifically say the black expat experience, even if, um, I mean, if you were to go and look up the official definition of an expat, technically not everyone we speak to is that because some of the people have grown up here. This is their home or they have actually migrated here. But we um, have claimed the word um, because I think a lot of the time um, you tend to find that the term expat is focused on your typical, whether Anglo, um, Anglo-American or whatever that looks like. So your, your white person would be called an expat. Your person of colour is likely to be called an immigrant. So you see that a lot in the US and the UK, especially. Anyone that's coming in the borders is, you know, from, from Africa or from Eastern Europe, they're classed as immigrants. Whereas when um, the same English people move to other cities, they're calling themselves expats. And um, it's something that I think is, is very problematic because it does... It, it, I guess, allows people or it's just an, a manifestation of, of people's prejudice. And I think it's dangerous, but really it's it's something that every individual does um, pick for themselves. So one of our last guests, uh, a guy called Jarius, has actually more or less moved here. He has a family here. So he uh, married a local woman. He has kids here. So for him, he uses the term immigrant to describe himself because he has moved here. He's not sending money back to the US. He's not, you know, he has no plans to do that. So this is his home right now. And he wants to be seen as having migrated. Whereas for us, we do think it's important to empower our community and claim that language. And, you know, even if it is someone that's moved here as a refugee, why shouldn't they be treated as an expat, if that's what's seen as positive. So that's sort of our thinking around it. You know, before speaking to Jarius, I had always just thought of myself in a, as an expat. But then the way he put it, it made me, it, it did give me a bit of conflict because I was thinking, yeah, I mean, I'm not really sp- sending money back to the UK. <laughs> like I'm not I'm <laughs> on the official you know, description of what an expat is. I, I definitely don't fit that. Um, and it did give me pause for thought. It does, I feel like the title expat does, you know, put you inside an in-group of um, above it all, yeah. almost. Um, and hearing Jaria say that, and, you know, th- that's probably one of the biggest things that we've learned from the podcast is like listening to other people talk about their experience changes our experience somewhat. Mm. Um, and it's that um, I, yeah, I didn't, I realized that I was using that word to, you know, so almost put myself in an in-group of, of privilege. Yeah. Um, and being Nigerian and being from a country that was an old British colony, I know what that expat term meant. I know that it meant that it afforded um, colonists a better lifestyle or a separate lifestyle than those of the people there. So I did feel a bit conflicted realizing that, you know, I'm... I'm not doing the same, but, you know, still using the word in the same sort of way. Mm. So one of the themes on a number of the different shows comes down to dating. And listening to the show, Fo, it sounds like you're having a blast in Hong Kong. <laughs> I mean, it just sounds like you are not wasting any time. Uh, but you, you, said, you said something really interesting. You said that Hong Kong bonuses every guy two points uh, when they get off the plane. So if you're kind of like, you know... 
a chubby six or a five back in the U.S. or the U.K., you get off the plane in Hong Kong, you get bumped up to an eight, right? Out of 10. Uh, women, you said, get bumped up, let's see, w no, get uh, subtracted by one or two, okay? So women go down, men go up. And then you said it's different for black people and different for white people. So white people may get the full two-point bump, but w black people get a one-point bump. Walk us through your whole theory about the scores <laughs> and how it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think numbers play into that mostly. I think that um, for, for various different reasons, a lot of black women are, I guess, more used to or prefer to date black men. And the fact that they move to a city state where there is um, very few black men, it just means that, you know, um, scarcity. So that bumps your numbers up a little bit. Um, but in terms of the difference between black people and white people, I think that that it does come into a little bit of the PR differences, um, especially like with local people, ver um, with black people, is that, you know, it's... It's not, I feel like people date, you know, races and people that they're comfortable with, that they're used to, that they're used to seeing. And if you don't see that many black people, it is a strange thing to, you, you probably, um, it's, it's just not as easy for you to, um, it's not as relatable. So um, for me, I, I went to school 16 to 18 in the north of Yorkshire and I was the only black person in the school. And you'd have people come up to you and go, you're the first black person I've ever spoken to and then run away. Um, <laughs> that was all they wanted to say. Um, but, it, it, and, but when dating came into play, obviously 16 to 18, that's what all's happening. You realize that um, the people that were into the, same, the similar kinds of things that you were into, so you had like a channel to speak about maybe hip hop or dance or something like that. Those are the people that you ended up dating. That's not to say that you weren't attracted to other people. It's just that there was a channel of familiarity. So I think that with black people being much, uh, you know, a huge minority here, it just means that people are less used to them. And it just means that dating just plays out in that way. And then for white people, they're two point jump. I sound so stupid saying it now. <laughs> but um, that two point jump is because, you know, they've got great PR here. The, um, it, the, white people are still attributed with wealth and power and privilege. And that hasn't gone away even since um, Hong Kong's became, um, sort of went from under British control. So th that still lingers. And so th that that plays into dating as well. Louisa, on a show, you, re you told a, a story of how your dating experience has been. And it sounds like it's been a lot different Let's take a listen to, to, to what you shared on the show. Hong Kong humbled me. Like, to be honest, it's not like I was out in these streets in London or in other places, but like, at least you feel, I felt, I was like, okay, I guess I'm an attractive woman. You know, like in London, I'm like, okay, you can see people looking at you, maybe on the train, like catch someone's eye. In Hong Kong, especially when I first came out on secondment, I was living in Wan Chai, and this was probably about two and a half months in. And I just, there was this day I was walking home. There was some tall man, tall white man was on his way back from basketball or something. So I was just like, oh, look at this man. Oh, I'm walking past him. This man looked through me. It was as if I did not exist. And like, guys, I know, okay, let's be clear. This is not me being arrogant. This is not, you know how like in regular life, even if someone is not into you, they will look at you and look away. Right. This man, it was as if I wasn't there. I was a ghost. And I make, I make it sound, you know, I'm laughing and stuff, but li like for real, for real, I felt invisible. So is that typical of the experience that you've had or is it been more exceptional? Um, that was very typical at that time. So I would say that in my experience anyway, I think it's also down to location. So now that I'm back in Hong Kong, I live in a different area. I live in uh, very close to Central. So everyone comes out in that area. All the restaurants and stuff are, are very much centered there. Before we go on much further, this for people who aren't familiar with Hong Kong, Central is the main business district on Hong Kong Island. People think of it as the Manhattan. It's the downtown. It's where it's the most one of the most expensive areas to live. And then Wan Chai, which is an area I used to live and where Fo 
I think still lives, is the kind of uh, think of it as a uh, as the Lower East Side of uh, of that's in Manhattan in the Village. You know, it's this kind of like hip place. It's very expensive, but there's bars, and so these are the kind of main expat areas on Hong Kong Island. So go ahead, uh, Luis. I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that. Perfect. Thank you. So um, yeah, so now living in Central, I do. It's I guess it's more of a mixed community. Sorry, when I say mixed, it's more of a mixed expat community. So I guess just statistically, I am meeting more people maybe. So I don't feel as invisible. To be honest, dating hasn't improved much, <laughs> but I don't feel invisible. But that first, the first stint here, living in sort of Wan Chai Causeway Bay, it was, you know, I think especially after two, two, three months, and also coming here without friends, so not even having a huge community yet. So I had a couple of friends here and there. So I think I was generally... I guess, less occupied with other things. So of course, you're more likely to notice what's going on in your dating life. And yeah, so that was, I very much had that that feeling of invisibility. And definitely it sort of, it didn't really affect my confidence all that much, but I definitely questioned myself. Um, but I did um, go on to say in that episode uh, that you paid from the snippet that I happened to go back to London a few weeks after that happened, that particular experience that I talk about. And literally within a few hours, it sort of felt like back to normal because it was, again, a community that was used to seeing people like me. So I was getting, you know, the regular interactions with people. And it was a nice reminder that, okay, the issue was not me, but was just where I happened to be at the time. Um, do you guys have an impression of what it's like um, on the LGBT scene for, for black people in Hong Kong? Oh, that's a great question. I have no idea. That's a good future episode, by the way. That was yes. A good yes. Future yeah, episode. Future episode yeah. So we had been trying to um, find someone that was in that community to interview. Because I know that it's, a, it's I mean, sort of coming from Taiwan where LGBT um, celebration is, you know, celebrated. Um, I know that it's not the case in Hong Kong. I've spoken to enough people to know that it's not as open as, um, say, Taiwan is. So um, we did have it in the back of our heads to try and find someone that we could speak to and share that experience. But currently, no. Mm. Your time in Hong Kong has been there at a moment of historical change. I mean, when you arrived in Hong Kong and where we are now has been radically different. There have been violent um, street protests. There's been the introduction of the new national security law. There's been a lot of change in Hong Kong, and you guys were right there. In fact, a lot of it was happening on Hong Kong Island, near Central and Wan Chai, where you guys live. Uh, what effect did that have on your experience there with all the, the, the tear gas, the protests, the, 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 just the commotion that was going on? What was your experience as part of that? Yeah, so I live in Wan Chai, and a lot of the protests would, or the marches would go past Wan Chai from Causeway Bay down to Central. And so I, I, you know, I'd stand on my balcony and watch them and you could see them starting off really sort of peacefully and marching. And then, you know, later on in the days where it descended into, you know, skirmishes with the police and tear gas and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, I was sat, you know, right in the middle of it. And it was bizarre for me because um, growing up in Nigeria in the West, my concept of protest and, ri and rioting is, is not... Is, is, you know, you're, you're scared. It's, it's a scary thing to see and you feel unsafe. But I've never felt so safe. Um, it was really weird. I, at some point, I think I, I'd... Because what would happen is they would tell you when there was a protest or a demonstration going on. So you'd get a text message. The police would tell you to, you know, stay away from this area, that, that sort of thing. And I'd not checked my phone. I'd gone downstairs and I'd, you know, walked out of my building and ended up in the middle of it. And it was like a parade, you know, that people kind of just, you know, made space for you. You walked through it. I've never, it was weird to see chaos and also um, kindness in the same place. Um, so that was my biggest, you know, that was my biggest, um, it was sort of the most shocking thing. Because obviously my parents were back home in the UK mm -hmm. watching the news and freaking out. And I was sitting here going, yeah, I mean, it's not, I can see you know, from that footage that you've just sent me from, you know, the BBC, I can see why you're panicking. But honestly, that's down my street and it's quite isolated. And um, so it, it definitely didn't feel as violent and terrifying on the ground. But I, I guess in some ways that's expat privilege. You get to opt out 
simply because you're not, it's not your fight. So you just go, I'm going to go into my apartment. But the interesting thing was there was a lot of police violence against protesters. Uh, this was, and, and there were a lot of complaints about it. And, and I'm just wondering if you've had a chance maybe to reflect on what you saw in the Hong Kong protests now in the context of NSARS, which the protest in Nigeria and the police brutality against people in Nigeria, which you guys dedicated a show to. I'm interesting, do you see any connection between what you saw in Hong Kong and NSARS in Nigeria? Yeah, exactly. So it's exactly that, that um, the NSARS thing, even though the, both, both protests were, were violent, it hit home harder, almost, the NSARS one, because that was a fight that you felt connected to, selfishly. Um, and we talk about this on the podcast a bit about empathy and you know listening to other people's story and then getting an understanding of what they're going through and then you can collaborate and empathize with them a lot better. And that was a thing that we've definitely learned over the last year was that we were kind of bystanders to the Hong Kong protest and sort of you know thinking this isn't our fight, but you know kind of empathize. You know you see shocking things, so there's no way you don't empathize with that. But the actual feeling of the movement and the desperation of what they were trying to get and the feeling of not getting anywhere, we, you you don't feel that. You can't you can't feel it the way that they do until it's your turn, until it's your fight and you're sitting, you know, in an apartment in Hong Kong watching your friends and family in the streets protesting for to, against police brutality. It, it's 180. You, you go, wow, I, you almost feel like you would feel the Hong Kong protest differently. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. It's a somewhat like from left field question. I, I was wondering if, if, you could, if both of you could talk a little bit about being Nigerian you know, kind of in or, or of Nigerian background, kind of in in the larger world, it's it's fascinating for me from a from a South African perspective to to see the kind of development over the last ten years or so of just how prominent Nigeria has become in South Africa, particularly culturally. Um, you know, and and how Nigeria, the Nigerian film industry, has is is a is a kind of a form of this. It's difficult to say to explain exactly. Like it's difficult to have to articulate it exactly. But there is there's now a big a big trend for South African stars to go and put in time in Nigeria and and to to, to collaborate with with Nigerian stars. It's like it's it's a thing where South Africa used to just assume that it is where it's at, where the action is in terms of media in, in Africa. And now that is gone, you know, kind of, and now, now South Africans really work hard to try and kind of get a foothold kind of in the Nigerian kind of glamour industry. And there is this kind of, in, like for me, an interesting kind of emergence of Nigeria as this like voice of, of the continent. Um, is that something that you experience too? Like how, how is it being Nigerian and then kind of moving in the world? I would say that it's not surprising that we're now here. So I, as a Nigerian, and of course a, a proud Nigerian, I would say that... There's no other kind of Nigerian. That's true. We are all <laughs> very, 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 very proud. To that's be. very different for South Africans. They are non-proud South Africans. <laughs> so um, growing up and there, there is excellence. To be honest, there's excellence everywhere. But in terms of, I will speak as a Nigerian and say that it is... It is inbuilt within us. It is part of our culture to succeed, to, to thrive, to do everything we can to the best of our ability. So Nollywood, um, our uh, film industry, has been, you know, since we were little, Nollywood has been huge from ages ago. Um, I would say that possibly it's with globalization, it's with the rise of um, social media and just generally everyone, like the world being more connected that these things, I guess, are just being seen now by the wider world. You know how, um, for example, with, with any sort of product or any sort of content you produce, it can be the best thing in the world. If people don't see it or don't know about it, then you're sort of, you know, it is what it is. It's not going to do well. Whereas if you have something solid and people find out, it's automatically going to do well. That's how I feel about Nigeria and our outputs. We've been doing this. We've been excelling. People have been um, thriving and producing amazing things in, in all sorts of industries. Um, so I think we now finally have a world stage. Because like when I was growing up in, in London, when I was um, much younger, so about, say, 10, it was very common to, 
you know, you're Nigerian or you're from wherever else you are in Africa and you say it very quietly. It's like, oh, no, I'm from London. You know, if you had a traditional name, you might say it with, you might use your English name instead. Whereas now you find that people are out there, you know, they're using their full traditional name. Celebrities are, are coming out to say, oh, yes, I am of Nigerian heritage or I am of whatever else. So we're seeing that a lot more because people are proud to be associated with it. So it is, you know... I just, it's great to see, but it's unsurprising to me. Yeah, I don't know where the switch actually came from. Why, you know, at what point did... It became cool. Did it become <laughs> cool to be, you know, Nigerian? But yeah, definitely. I mean, um, when I came out to, <laughs> when I came out to Hong Kong, my dad kind of sat me down and was like, okay, you're going to Hong Kong, congratulations, da, da, da. It's a good move, this, down the third. But don't forget you're Nigerian, so keep your eyes open. Right. You're not there to just sit around and enjoy it. You've got stuff to do. And that is indicative. I, I don't think that any other Nigerian is raised in any other kind of way. It is your, you know, you know, it's your duty to, to hammer, to 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 do it properly. Um, and, you know, we kind of try to we, we carry that with us. You know, I definitely do in my company. I want them to know that the reason I do well here. It's not just individuals, it's because I'm Nigerian. So the next Nigerian you see, you'll be like, oh, he's, he's probably really good. She's probably <laughs> really good because, you know, Nigerians are, are this way. That's the PR that we want. Uh, it's super ambitious. It's super hardworking. And it's really proud. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, that I mean, that comes through in the show loud and clear is this concept that you guys promote of black excellence. And that's what I enjoy most about the show is meeting these people who, after a 45 minute you know, podcast, you really feel like you get to know them. And and again, it, it, we started the show with a discussion about how the perception of black expats, migrants, immigrants, whatever that we, we call it, um, is, again, very narrow in terms of either they live in chunking mansions, which is the, the that immigrant experience in Hong Kong, or they are students, or they're, but there's not the breadth that you guys are bringing to us. And I think that is, we're just so excited that you are filling that space with these amazing stories about that. Curious if you've received any reaction uh, from Chinese listeners. So you're your focus is primarily going to be people who are interested in the African and black diaspora experience in a place like Hong Kong. You're obviously talking to local uh, black expats who are there. But have you had any feedback from either Hong Kong Chinese, other Chinese people about the show and what life is like for, for black people in Hong Kong? Yeah. So, I mean, local friends here that have, you know, just because they know that they know us and we know that we've done the podcast, have listened to it and gone back. And, you know, a lot of their feedback has been, oh, my God, I never knew that it was, you know, that yeah. you had this. I, I didn't, I never knew about this scenario, this scenario, this scenario. So it's been eye opening for them. I think that, like you said, you, you know, your the thing with the podcast is you're sharing people's stories. And otherwise, you'd never you'd never hear that. You know, people get on the podcast, we get them to open up with their dialogue and tell them something, you know, tell us a story, a funny or a moving story that has happened to them since they got to Asia. And then they're relaxed. And then you're now kind of like a fly in the wall of this yeah. very intimate conversation between black people in a place that isn't home. Um, and if you are, you know, you're, if you are a local Hong Konger or a Chinese person, you it's it's hard to get into that room. Um, pe people don't tell their stories in that way unless they feel comfortable. But to be fair, that's what a lot of white people in America said about Black Lives Matter, that they hadn't seen the violence and the racism and the police brutality until it was put right in front of their face. So this idea of like, I didn't know, and I'm sure it's the same in the UK as well, that these conversations just are not jumping the racial barriers the way that they should. And um, so e even... With Black Lives Matter, um, I had friends from the UK that I went to school with for years and years and years and years sort of reach out and say, whoa, dude, I n is this what your life has been like? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, why didn't you, why don't you tell us that? Why would you, you know, I, I lived in a house, there were seven of us at university and I was the only black one there and they're still my good friends till this day. And one of them called and asked, you know, why have, why is this the first he's hearing about this? And it's like... It's a bit of a bummer, dude. Like, <laughs> in, what, in what context would I bring that up and just have everyone say, you know, we, we went back, we were drinking and partying. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing to bring up. But, you know, once 
you go to your other friend's house and some, you know, they've been stopped and searched by the police and they're feeling upset about it. You all sit down on the floor and you talk about it. Um, and, you know, that's where those conversations happen. You know, what are some of what are some of the experiences um, that you'd like to to um, to explore in the future? Like what is what is on your your kind of list of 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 different kinds of people or different kinds of um, yeah kind of experiences that that you that you'd like to to um, discuss with people coming in, in, in the coming time? I think definitely um, we would love to get someone on, the, at least or people on the show from the LGBT community. I would love to find out more about their experiences. I know that they would um, definitely have a, a different side to share that people would be interested in. Especially with dating. Espe yeah, especially <laughs> on the dating side. Um, I think also we generally plan on, on doing more outside Hong Kong. So of course we started with Hong Kong for this season. We probably will do the same for season two. We're already um, mapping out the next uh, 10 or so episodes. But beyond that, we want to be speaking to people across Asia um, we are very aware that there's, you know, there's, there's huge black communities across the different countries in the, in the region. So we'd love to capture that. We'd love to showcase that. Um, so that's definitely part yeah. of our plans. We actually, I mean, when we were coming up with the idea for the podcast, that was the original plan. Yes. COVID kind of changed it. Like, <laughs> well, you can't travel. So, <laughs> so we focused, yeah. <laughs> uh, on Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, so yeah, more communities, more, but one thing that we were, you know, we've kind of learned I think we expected to hear a singular narrative from people when we started out the podcast. So in our mid-episode recap, that was the, you know, the revelation. It's like, actually, everyone's experiences are different. And I think there's probably going to be more of a focus on getting out those uniquities of people's experiences yeah. sort of with intent. Um, I think the first couple of episodes, we, you know, we got our feet wet and we talked about, you know, the you know, middle of the line things like dating and um, why did you come here and h how long are you going to stay and that sort of thing, you know. Um, but I think that as time goes on and our audience gets used to hearing these stories, they're going to want more in-depth, more nuanced stories and um, situations. The podcast is Homegrown and you have to look up Homegrown Hong Kong or Homegrown China or Homegrown. You have to add, there's a couple Homegrown podcasts out there. So don't, don't get the po the podcast with the white people. <laughs> it's not the homegrown. Basically. It's a different homegrown. Uh, but you can find it on all the podcasts, you know, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. This should be absolutely the essential listening to add to your playlist. Uh, tell everybody where they can follow you guys if they want to connect with you guys. You have a great social following on Instagram. And in addition to the podcast, where can people find this amazing podcast of yours and, and how to connect? Or Homegrown the Pod on Twitter. And of course, people can, you know, drop us an email where, where we love hearing people's feedback. We love um, interacting with people. So it's Homegrown the Podcast at gmail.com for anyone that wants to drop us an email. But I would say we're probably most active on, on Instagram. And if you're listening to this and you would love to come on the podcast and be grilled by myself and Louisa, um, yes, yeah, send us an email and we'd love to have you on. Yeah. I'm going to put the email, the Instagram, and the link to iTunes in the show notes so everybody can easily find you and connect with you. Once again, I want to thank both of you, Fantastic Foe and Louisa, for staying up late in Hong Kong after a long day working to join us on our humble little podcast. And so we're really great, really appreciative that you did that. Thank you so much and best of luck with the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Kobus, I don't think our discussion with Fantastic Foe and Luisa did justice to the show because the show is actually a lot more lively and fun. We naturally went as, particularly as a journalist, I go to the darker places. And this was where, you know, all of the, the racism and all of the questions of discrimination, but that is an important part of their show. And it's, it was definitely a theme throughout a lot of the interviews, but it's a lot more upbeat and lively. They're filling such an important void in the discussion. And it's one that, again, as you and I know from attending all these panels where people do bring up the question of race in China and also, you know, Chinese, African American, African black race relations, it's very, very complicated and it lacks the nuance that, that these two are bringing to the discussion. So I cannot recommend enough to add their podcast to your playlist. It is absolutely essential listening. It's fun, it's informative, it's enlightening. There's a lot of those moments that he talked about with saying, I just didn't know that. 
And again, it's not for any necessarily for any particular ignorance. The experiences that everybody have are so unique and distinct that, of course, you can't know it. But it's really an important voice that I think they're bringing to it. Yeah, I love listening to their show because it also gives such a like fine grained um, window into into just the the kind of you know kind of breadth of experiences of of people who who travel to Asia and who live in Asia, um, and all of the different realities of just just moving to a different continent. It's it's fascinating. Fascinating listening. One very important distinction is that it's really important to note that this is a Hong, this is a podcast about Hong Kong, and not China. And one of the things about living in Hong Kong, especially as an expat, which I did for many years, is that even though you're right, you, you know, you're an hour away from mainland China, you might as well be a million miles away sometimes. That the mindset is very removed. And, and, there, and people are very disconnected from China, which is very, very interesting. So it's not surprising to me that they're not bringing in more Chinese issues in these initial discussions, and it's focused largely on the Hong Kong experience. And I do hope that they will start to talk to expats in places like Guangzhou, in Beijing, Shanghai, because again, there's a much larger population. The largest African population in all of Asia is based in Guangzhou. So that is very interesting as well to be able to find some of those experiences and those stories. And I think these two will bring a lot of insight to the discussion. Again, not just in China, Hong Kong, but maybe the rest of Asia. So, uh, And also it brought back to me, they're just starting out their podcast. And it reminded me of when you and I were starting out our own podcast and trying to figure out the voice and they're doing it after work and it's a passion project. And it's just really neat to see that energy and that ability to, to amplify voices that are underheard. Yeah, and they're both so great on, on audio, you know, kind of they, they have such a natural rapport um, and they're so lively and fun. So yeah, it's a massive recommend from my side. Massive recommend from my side. I'll put the links again in the show notes so you can follow them and connect with them. And again, take them up at their word when, you know, Fantastic Foe said, reach out. So if you have an experience that you want to share with them, they would love to hear from you. They're very accessible. Again, all of that will be in the show notes. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. If you would like to follow issues like the ones that we're doing today in this podcast, please sign up to our daily email newsletter, chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. We do an in-depth the deepest dive you can get out there on China-Africa issues every single day. Uh, it's really the most comprehensive digest anywhere that you'll find. We'd love to have you part of our large and growing reader community that gets the newsletter and follows what's going on in China-Africa relations. We also follow what's going on in places like Hong Kong and China with the, the Black and African community. So we would love to be able to share all of that with you. So once again, chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. It's only $3 for three months just to try it out. See if you like it. If you don't like it, cancel any time. So that'll do it. We'll be back again next week with another edition. Until then, for Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash chinaafricaproject to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. Thank you.